Good evening, everyone. Thanks for um, interrupting your Saturday to um, join us for this um, the, was it third lesson um, on the final weekend of lockdown, hopefully. So a um, bit of an update on the, running the practical sessions for this course. I've uh, managed to figure out which coaches have been vaccinated and which ones are going to be working on that first weekend. So Monday morning, I should be able to post a timetable for the practical sessions for this course. And for everyone that signed up to do that practical, I'll, I'll flick an email out and let you know when the, that those sessions will run. Um, there will be a choice. So um, I think probably most people will be available at the weekend. So main focus will be at the weekend, Saturday and Sunday, but there will be an evening option and also um, maybe a, a, a midweek, you know, it's kind of during the day option for, for those that still can't get into the office, even though the restrictions have been eased. But okay, without further ado, let's um, crack on with lesson three. Um, here we go. So, um, yep, so we have a look at, um, uh, not how can we see the wind, because we did that in lesson two. Should have updated the PowerPoint, sorry about that. We'll have a look at the, the recap quiz. We'll have a look at the telltales, um, sail shape, a bit more on how we can control the shape of the sail. We'll look at reefing and the man overboard maneuvers as well. So let's have a look at this recap quiz. Um, so what are the three main points of sail and the feeling associated with when sailing? So that's going to be a bit hard for you guys to ask, answer because you haven't been sailing yet so you haven't experienced how the boat feels but it's probably worth answering that question anyway and letting you know what it's going to be like. Um, so we've got um, well also the weather forecast and how the sail works. So there are three questions. So if we're close hauled and we're going upwind the boat feels quite powerful. The boat will be leaning over a little bit. Um, quite common actually to have a bit of water coming over the side of the boat. That's all sort of quite normal. Um, you can kind of feel a little bit of pressure on the tiller. So, you know, when we're on the dock and the boat's not moving, the tiller and the rudder move quite freely. But when there's water going over the rudder, then it feels, kind of heavy if you like. Um, yep, and definitely it can be cold and wet. Um, we're going into the waves, so it's a bit bumpy. Um, yeah, and a good wet weather jacket is um, needed for upwind sailing, particularly on a windy day. On a beam reach, there's a bit more speed. Um, the boat does heel a little bit, but a bit less than when we go upwind. And when I say heel, it's the boat kind of leaning over. Um, the waves are hidden on the side of the boat, so that might create some sort of strange sensations. Um, but the definite fear, feel of power and speed when we're reaching. On a broad reach, well, we're probably going to have a bit more speed. The waves might be giving us a little push and we might be surfing the waves. And getting a big boat surfing is an amazing feeling. And when we're running, going downwind, there's no, no feeling of speed. Suddenly it's like the wind has just been turned off. And that's because, you know, the wind is moving and we're going with the wind. So our speed feels very much different. So when we're going upwind, we've got the wind blowing in our face. So let's say the wind is, say, 10 knots. If we have five knots of boat speed into the wind, it will feel like 15 knots of wind because of our speed going into the 10 knots of wind going the opposite way. When we're going downwind, in that same 10 knots of wind, if our boat's doing five knots, and the wind is doing 10 knots, we're only going to feel five knots of wind. So, it, yeah, very different feelings and sensations, um, the, the waves will probably, you know, suddenly the water feels flat as well when we're going downwind because 
often we're going in the same direction as the waves and at the similar speed to the waves. So, that, that, you know, it's less kind of splashy and basically we turn downwind and everything goes quiet and it's quite peaceful. Sailing upwind, we're kind of working hard and um, there's a lot of waves hidden in front of the boat and there's water coming over the bow, particularly on those windy days. Okay, so on a weather forecast, well, we want to have a look at the Coast Guard, uh, Met Service, Windy Predict Wind, Wind Guru, the selection of those um, to really ascertain whether the wind that we're seeing now out of the window is going to continue for the rest of the day. We don't want to go out sailing because it's a nice sunny day and then find that we're coming back in a storm. Um, and how does a sail work? Well, the sail works like an aeroplane wing. It creates lift. And if it creates lift, then we'll go fast. If it's not creating lift, well, it's just a bed sheet flapping around in the wind, very much like a flag. Um, apart from when we go downwind. When we go downwind, we're just being pushed along by the wind. Um, it's more like a parachute then rather than an aeroplane. Okay, so let's have a look at these um, telltales. So the kind of slang name is woolies. And they're literally just bits of wool that are stuck on the sail. And they show us how the air is flowing over the sail. So that is what they look like. There's some red ones and some green ones. Normally the green ones on the starboard side and the uh, red ones on the port side of the sail. And if we compare the two, we can see how the wind is flowing over the fabric on both sides. So if we bring that up on the, the sail, so we're, there we've got the wind flowing over the sail and the telltales are flying in a nice kind of horizontal straight line. It's never going to be perfect. They're going to flap around a little bit, but we just need to position the sails so the telltales are flying us kind of straight as we can get them. And at that point, the boat will be powerful and we'll be going quite fast. And that's the best technology for uh, ascertaining whether the sail is working efficiently. You know, with all the fancy computers and things that there are around now, a little bit of grandma's knitting stuck on the sail is the best thing there is to just visualize how the air is flowing over the sail. So the um, boat number six there, the small white one, uh, that's one of our Elliot sevens. And those circles are around the telltale. So on the main sail, we've just got what we call leech telltales. I'll go into what the leech is in a minute, but they're just on the back edge of the sail. And that helps us see how the air is exhausting off the back of the sail. And we use that to position the mainsail. We generally are driving the boat though from the head sail, the one at the front of the boat. And we'll be using the telltales on that forward edge of the sail, um, both for steering and for um, positioning the sail. So when we're sailing upwind, we'll pull the sail in as close as it will come to us. And then we need to steer the boat and keeping an eye on those telltales just to make sure we've got air flowing on both sides. And uh, if it's not, well, we're probably in the no-go zone. So that can, those telltales can help us figure out where the no-go zone is. The other boat, that big red one, that's a TP-52. That's probably one of the, the biggest sort of professional sailing series in the world. And they still have telltales. So their circles, they've got the leech telltales at the top of the sail and then that main sail has got some big circles around it but that head sail will also have telltales on as well. Now this picture here shows the air flowing over the outside of the sail really well and the air not flowing very well over the inside of the sail and there's a couple of things that we can do to change that to help us sail the boat more efficiently. Uh, if we do nothing though, our sail is gonna end up flapping and it's, at that point, it's just a flag. It's not developing any power at all. 
um, what we need to do is adjust the sail so both of the telltales are flying in a nice way. So if we've got that situation where the inside telltale is um, not flying straight, then there's a couple of things we can do. We can trim the sails on. So basically if we pull on the sail a bit closer to us, then that inside telltale will have a better airflow or we can turn away from the wind slightly and uh, we can correct the telltale then. And basically we want to adjust our steering so that we're kind of splitting the wind. Half of it's going one side, half of it's going the other side and we've got good airflow over both sides. We will look at this next slide, which would be the opposite of that. Basically, we've got the outside telltale that's flapping around and we've got good airflow on the inside. Now that's um, quite typical of a boat that's been over trimmed, we might say. So the sail is too close to us. And quite often, so if you've been sailing upwind and you bear away more onto a reach, the telltales on the outside of the sail will just hang straight down because there's no air going over it. If you look at the top right hand picture, you'll see that the air comes along, it hits the inside of the sail and it doesn't go any further. So there's no air to flow over that sail at all around the outside anyway. So what we need to do is to ease the sail out. So that picture that's just appeared in the bottom right hand corner, the wind is in the same direction as the top right picture, but the sail is in a much better angle and the wind is able to flow over it as illustrated by the telltales. So if the outside telltale is fluttering around, then we can ease the sail, let the sail further away from us, or we can go slightly upwind. So we can turn the boat or we can adjust the sail and the angle of attack, that angle that we talked about before in lesson two, will change irrespective of whether we move the tiller or pull on a rope and adjust the sail position. So we've got two ways of adjusting the angle of the sail to, compared to the angle of the wind, either by adjusting the whole boat or by just easing the sail in and out. But when we do the practical stuff, we can do a bit of trial and error, and basically we can, we can have a play with both kind of methods. And we would use both uh, methods depending on the situation. You know, if we were on a reach and we, we were happy with that course, then we would be adjusting the sails so the telltales were right. If we were sailing upwind, and our sails were all the way in, well, we can't adjust them anymore. We could let them out a little bit, but we can't pull them any closer to us because they're already as close as they'll come. So then we have to use the tiller to adjust the angle of the sail uh, compared to the wind. Okay, here's a picture of Team New Zealand. And you, if you look closely, you'll see some little white dots on the sail. So there's a green stripe just by the E of Emirates that goes vertically up the mainsail. And that's got a, a nice little row of white dots. And on each one of the green stripes on the headsail, um, there's some white dots again, um, just under that green stripe or on the forward edge of the headsail. And there, the stickers that they use to stick the wool on. So even Team New Zealand, with all of the money and the development that they've got to throw at that boat, they still use a few bits of wool stuck on their sail to visualise how the air is flowing over it. And they'll be watching those telltales very closely, making sure they've got maximum performance out of their sail. Okay. So let's have a look at how we can control the shape of the sail. And as I said in lesson two, it's always going to be a triangle. When we say sail shape, we mean the curvature that it's got in it. So we can see that on, we say, look at boat three in the middle there, 
the head sail has got quite a nice curve to it. And those um, black lines on that sail, they're there so we can see that curvature a bit easier. So we can see that it's um, quite flat towards the back of the sail, but there's quite a big curve at the front edge of the sail. And that's the aeroplane wing shape that we're looking for. Okay, so we've got a number of controls that we can use to control the, the sail shape, that curvature that's in the sail, both at the bottom of the sail and at the top of the sail, and at the back edge of the sail as well. Um, so let's go through some uh, sailing terminology and we'll name some parts of the sail, and then we can get into having a look at the controls that we use to adjust the shape in that area of the sail. So here we've got a main sail, and there's each corner has got a hole in it, and that helps us attach it to the boat. So the corner at the front of the main sail at the bottom, just above the boom there, is called a tack. The one at the back of the boom, that's called a clue. And then we've got the head at the top of the sail. So the halyard, the rope that pulls the sail up the mast, that will be tied on to the the hole in the, in the head up there. Okay, so there's um, the back edge of the sail, that's called the leech. Um, just like us, the bottom of the sail is called a foot. So foot at the bottom, head at the top. Um, sailors are not very imaginative, but I suppose they come up with some quite strange words, like if we look at leech and clue, but foot at the bottom, head at the top, and that forward edge of the main sail is called a luff. Now, the head sail, the triangle is kind of like the other way around, but it's the same deal. So the forward edge is called the luff, and the back edge, which is straight on the head sail, is called the leech, and then we've got the foot at the bottom, and then we've got the head at the top, and the holes are the same as well. So the hole at the front, at the bottom, that's called the tack, and then the clue on the foot of the sail at the, at the back edge. Um, so the names stay the same and in the same position, but the sail might change shape. So in terms of the controls that we use, so this is a photograph of an MRX, one of our training boats. So we've got a backstay, a Cunningham, a boom van to give it its full name, a jib car, an outhaul and a traveller. And we're going to go through all of those controls and I'll try and make it as simple as I can. It is pretty tough learning this stuff via Zoom. It's a lot easier when you can actually get on a boat and actually pull on a piece of rope and see what moves. Um, but we'll make sure we, we do that during the practical um, classes that we run. Okay, so let's have a look at the outhaul. So the outhaul is probably the most simplest control to understand. And the outhaul is that sort of orangey red rope that's tied on to the, the clue. So it's on the foot of the sail on the, on the back edge, the leech. So the corner between the foot and the leech at the bottom there, that's where the outhaul uh, is tied onto. And if we pull on that rope, it will simply stretch the clue to the end of the boom and change how much curvature we've got on the foot of the sail. And we've got some more pictures here showing it. So that gray rope there, that's the um, outhaul that's attached to the clue of the sail on an MRX. And there we have it um, eased, we, we would say. So the clue is a bit further down the boom. And that red arrow is showing that it's got quite a bit of curve in it. And if we look at the right hand picture, you can see that it's that the sail has got quite a nice, beautiful aeroplane wing shape where it's quite fat on the front edge and then it goes thinner and um, goes very slim towards the, the back of the, of the sail. So a sail that's got more depth to it, so that red arrow is bigger, um, is going to be more powerful than a more slimmer sail. And if you want to have a look at a slimmer sail, then we've got one coming up. So here we can see that the clue has been pulled 
much closer to the end of the boom now. And the effect it has on the sale is quite significant. So those two top pictures, the one on the left, we've got the red arrow there, which shows much less daylight coming through between the boom and the sale. So the sale is definitely flatter. And the one on the right, that's a photograph taken from below the boom looking up. And you can see there's practically no gap there at all. So that sail has been pulled quite flat and that will be less powerful than the previous slide. So let's just go back and have a look at the other one. Um, yeah, so that's, oh, I'll go back a bit more. Yeah, there we go. So that's with the outhaul eased, quite a big curve in the sail. That would be a very powerful sail that. And that's what it looks like when this, the outhaul has been pulled quite hard on and we've flattened the sail. And all of the other controls are basically this simple. They have more complicated names. Please don't get confused by that. The outhaul, simply we're hauling on a rope and we're pulling the sail out to the end of the boom as much as we can. Um, there is a reason why the other names are, are what they are, and we'll, we'll have a look at some of those in a bit. But um, all we're doing with all of these controls is just flattening the sail and making it less steep. Because the flatter the sail, the less power it will have. And you might be thinking, well, why do we want to do that? That doesn't sound much fun. Surely we want to have the most powerful boat we can. And that's true. But the wind range would be quite narrow if we had one fixed position for our sails. So when it's really light wind, we want a very powerful sail to make the best use of the power that we have that's in the wind. As the wind picks up, we're gonna to need to depower the boat. Yes, it will make the boat less powerful and therefore less quick, but actually it gives us more control over the boat and you know, if we can sail in a straight line rather than wiggling around all over the place because the wind is in charge rather than us in being in charge, then we'll be um, a lot faster. So yes, we're getting rid of some power in the sail, but we've got a very good reason to do that. And that is to keep control of the boat and keep it in a nice straight line and going in the direction we want to go in. Okay, so Cunningham. So, in the 1950s, during the America's Cup then, um, Mr. Cunningham uh, wanted to have the most powerful sail that he could. And the rule at the time was that the mast had to be a certain height. And to adjust the tension in the luff, that forward edge of the sail, what they would do is they'd pull on the halyard and pull the sail up a bit more to stretch that bit of fabric just just in just behind the mast there so if you're gonna have to pull the sail up a little bit to increase the tension in the sail or decrease the the tension to make the sail more powerful the mast is going to have to be longer than the actual sail so you're going to need a little bit at the top of the mast that you can pull the sail up if you need to to depower it and then lower the sail back down and make it real baggy again and Mr. Cunningham thought that was a stupid idea. He wanted the sail to go right to the top of the mast, but then he couldn't adjust his luff tension. You know, the, the sail was in that fixed position. So he created another hole at the bottom of the sail. And rather than pulling the sail up to stretch the fabric, he decided to pull the sail down to stretch the fabric and make it tight. So we call it a Cunningham. If when it's on a main sail, if it's on a different sail, like a head sail, which you do sometimes find it on you know, high performance sailing boats, they, they might have effectively a Cunningham on the head sail as well. Most cruising boats wouldn't. So if it's on a, a head sail, it's called a downhaul. Um, so unlike the outhaul, the, the name basically tells you what it does. It just pulls the sail down. And the reason why we want to pull it down is to tighten up that front edge of the sail. So let's move on and have a look at the MRX. So here we are 
we're going to pull on that yellow rope. At the moment, the rope is eased, and you'll see um, there's like a red stripe on that forward edge of the sail, and just above that, there's a little hole, and there's a hook in that, and then there's a little rope that's actually on the other side of the sail. And when we um, ease the sail, you'll see as we look up the mast that there is a few wrinkles in the sail. The sail doesn't look really tight up there. And when the wind's actually blowing on it, that will have a bit of a curvature in it and be more, more powerful. So if we ease the Cunningham, we're going to have a more powerful sail. Um, if we pull on the Cunningham and pull the sail down, you can see now the picture on the right hand side, that hole has come down. That red stripe I was talking about has got a big curve in it. And that area of the sail looks a bit ugly. That's not going to be very efficient. But the bit above it is really tight. And that's going to be flat. And that's going to reduce the power that the sail has. Oops, I clicked on a bit too far. Um, yeah, so uh, if we want to decrease the power of the sail, we want to pull on that rope a bit harder and we'll have less power. So in heavy wind, we're going to pull all of these controls on basically. So in light winds, they're all going to be fairly slack and we're going to have a nice um, full lots of curve in the sail and that's going to develop lots of power. And as the wind increases in its strength, we're going to need to pull on those ropes a little bit. And I mentioned earlier that when we're sailing upwind, we might feel a little bit of weight on the tiller as the water is flowing over the rudder. And if we find that the tiller gets really heavy, that's probably an indication that we either need to adjust the sails, like look at the telltales and make sure our sails are in the right position, or depower the boat. And that will mean that we're not fighting with the boat to try and keep it in a straight line. And the boat will be faster, actually, if we you know, if you were wrestling with the boat, that tends to be slow. If the boat is going along quite nicely and it's easy, then the boat actually is quite fast. The other point though, when we're wrestling with the tiller and we're, we're, we're fighting to try and keep the boat in a straight line, that will feel it extreme, that will feel fast, but in reality, it'll actually be going quite slow. If we can depower the boat and make the the tiller feel more neutral, um, then we'll actually have better control of the boat and our speed through the water will be better. So we're flattening the sail to decrease the power that it generates. Now the boom vang, if we look at the picture in the middle, you'll see a kind of metal pole at an angle. That, that's not the boom vang, that's just a, a spring that holds the boom up. The boom vang is that black pulley and there's a white rope, which is maybe hard to see. Um, and we, if we pull on that, so if you look at the drawing, you can see the blue rope there at a 45 degree angle. So if we pull on that rope, then those pulleys are gonna get closer together. And if they do that, then the end of the boom is gonna get lower and we'll end up with a flat, flatter sail up the leach. So we've got a few pictures of that, I think, coming up. Oh, no, we don't. Um, I'll get the model out shortly and we'll um, have a look at the model and I'll go through these controls once we get all the way through. So the other thing we've got on the MRX is, um, oh, sorry, this is talking about the um, boom vang again. So on a small boat, the boom vang can um, bend the mast which doesn't sound like a good thing. We're not talking about a permanent bend. We're, we're talking about bending it on purpose because it gives us um, a flatter sail. So we can see that part of the boom, the lower section has actually moved forward. So that's stretching that bottom section of the sail, very similar way to the outhaul. Instead of pulling the sail to the end of the boom, it's pulling the sail forward. So we're still stretching the sail at the bottom. And 
the force that the boom vang is putting on the boom is being transferred up the back edge of the sail, the leech, to the head of the mast, which is pulling the mast back. So that leech, the back edge of the sail, that's going to be really flat as well. And we can do that on the MRX with the um, uh, backstay as well. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, so all of this stuff is, we're just talking about flattening the sail. And at level one, please don't get confused by all the names and like the different areas. Don't, don't think that it's like really complicated and you need to have a degree in I know aerodynamics to make the thing work. That's not true at all. As the wind picks up, we're gonna pull all of these controls on. And we, if we still don't have control of the boat, we're gonna pull them all on a bit harder. And you know, when you've got a bit of experience, then you'll be able to look at the sail and say, oh yeah, I think we need a bit more boom vang or maybe a bit less cunning. Um, but we can build on your experience as you get out sailing. So we're going through the controls and what they actually do. Please don't get confused. There's just bits of rope that pull on something and we're gonna pull them all on really hard when it's really windy. And we're going to have more slack and loose when it's light winds because we want a nice full shape in the light winds and we want a flatter sail in the heavier winds. Okay, so we've got a couple of pictures coming up of the backstay on the MRX, and the backstay is more powerful than the boom vang. It does a very, very similar thing. Um, it's basically the wire that comes off the top of the sail, the top of the mast, sorry, and it goes back to the bottom of the boat. And if we pull on that and make it shorter, then it will pull the top of the mast back and that will put the bend in. And because it's acting at the top of the mast rather than a little way down the boom, it's a lot more powerful than the boom vang. So it pretty much does the same thing. So this slide shows um, two MRX boats. One has got the backstay eased and it's got a nice straight mast. The other one has got the backstay pulled on. You can see that it's put quite a bend in the mast. And the mast is designed to do that. And it's really useful and a very powerful control that we have on the MRX boats to um, flatten the sail. And we actually use it quite a lot. So backstay off, sails are more powerful pull the back, stay on, sails less powerful. Yeah. Okay, so the Traveller. Now, this is a picture of our Elliot 7. And the Traveller, I think, is one of the things that confuses people the most. And I'll do my very best to um, describe what that does. If you have any questions, please do just flick your microphone back on and, and ask away. And I will get the model going and we'll go through this. So on the Elliott 7, the main sheet, the rope that controls where the boom is, so we're going to let the sail out and pull the sail closer to us, um, that main sheet is on the end of the boom. So when we pull the sail in, it also gets pulled, the boom gets pulled downwards. So in effect, on the Elliott 7, with the way that this is rigged up, the main sheet, but also a vang, if you like, it does the same thing as the boom vang as well. So the traveller, the bit that's circled, is just a pulley, and rather it being in a fixed position, we can move that pulley. So we can set the shape of the sail we like, by pulling the down on the, on the um, main sheet, pulling that boom down. And when we got the sail, so it's in the nice shape that we want, we can adjust its position with the traveler. So if we pull the block that's in the middle of the traveler, as it's shown, all the way up to where the eight is on the back of the boat, then the sail will be closer to us if we pull the block down to the other end of the traveler, 
sort of more where the, the um, line foundation sticker is. Then the sail will be further away from us, but the length of the main sheet hasn't changed at all. So the boom is gonna be in its same position and therefore the sail is gonna have the same shape. If we ease the, ease the main sheet, what tends to happen on the Elliott 7 is the boom will lift. And as the boom lifts, we get more curve in the sail and a more powerful sail. So one of the reasons why we might be easing the main sail out is because we just got hit by a gust of wind. And initially, as we ease the sail out on the main sheet, the sail becomes more powerful because the boom lifts up and produces a nice curve in the sail. So rather than doing that, we can just move the traveler and then we maintain a nice flat sail, but the boom goes out and the gust goes past us and then we can pull it back on again and bring the sail in close to us after the gust has gone by. Um, this picture here is a picture of a Volvo ocean racing boat, um, Vestas. Um, that was uh, a few years ago now. But you can see that by how much spray there is around, there's a lot of wind. The boat's very powerful. They've even dragged a sail that they're not using that's in its bag up on the high side of the boat, trying to use the weight of that sail to keep the boat flat. They've got a big wave coming over the boat and there's lots of white water going over the cabin top. The guy there doing the trimming is gonna get wet. But that yellow circle is around the traveler and that you can see right in the bottom of the picture, bottom of that yellow circle, there's a, the main sheet block. So they've dropped their traveler down, trying to survive the gust that they've just been hit with. And in the lighter conditions, the traveler would be at the end of the other end of that track and the main sheet would be eased. So the, the boom would be in the same position across the boat, but the end of the boom would be a bit higher and it would be a more powerful sail. Um, yep, so we mainly use it for when we're sailing upwind. And yes, very much for keeping stability of the boat. Uh, yeah, all right. Let's have a look at the head sail. Now, basically, we want to do the same thing with the head sail. We want to control the curvature that's in the head sail. And we use the jib cars. If you're American or maybe in Europe, they might call them fair leads, but I've only ever heard them call um, jib cars um, in New Zealand. So basically what that is, that's a pulley that's on a track and we can move it forward closer to the bow or we can move it backwards. And that changes the sheeting angle and that can change the shape of the sail. So the lower picture shows the jib cars on the MRS. So that blue rope would be our jib sheet, the rope that controls where that head sail is. It's called a jib sheet because that head sail is called a, is it actually a jib because it's a small one. Um, right, let's go on to the drawings about that. Oh, actually, maybe we go back and just have a look at that arrow. So that arrow there, shows you the angle of the rope, the sheet. And um, we can change the, that angle by moving the, the jib car. So here we've got a head sail and we can see that the jib car is pretty much in the middle of the track. If we move the jib car forward, you can see that the sheeting angle has got much steeper and we're pulling down on the leech, the back edge of the sail, more than we are on the foot. And that would be a powerful sail. Um, and we've got a nice big curve in the foot of the sail. At the bottom picture, um, the jib car is at the back of the track and you can see that the force that the rope puts on the sail acts more on the foot of the sail. So the foot of the sail is quite flat and the leech, the back edge is actually quite slack. Um, and that would be 
a less powerful sail. So with the picture at the top, the fuller, more powerful sail, we've got that nice curve in the foot of the sail and the top of the sail is engaged as well. So the top of the sail will be at the same angle to the wind as the bottom of the sail. On the lower picture, we've got a very flat foot. So that bit of the sail won't be very powerful. And the, because the leech is quite soft, there's not got a lot of tension in it, the top bit of the sail will probably flap like a flag and not create any lift. So in effect, we've done two things here. We've made the sail less powerful because we've flattened the bottom bit. And we've also decided not to use the top bit of the sail. So we've kind of made the sail smaller at the same time. So that's a much less powerful sail at the bottom. And the one at the top is, is a very powerful sail. Um, okay, we've got a few more bits about twist. So I alluded to that the top of the sail could be at a different angle to the wind as the bottom of the sail. And that's what that picture there is, uh, is showing us. So at the bottom of the sail, the sail is closer to us and at the top, it's further away from us. And we might wanna do that because the wind at the top of the mast might be different to the wind on the surface of the water. Um, we might also wanna do that because we wanna twist off some power in the same way we did with that head sail on the previous slide. If we make the top bottom of the sail really flat and let the, the other, the top of the sail open up and peel off and flap, we'll just be using the bottom of the sail. We can, excuse me, we can do that with the main sail as well, using the, the twist, we call it. It's very difficult to see on the boat, kind of need a lot of experience to, to kind of spot that. The stripes that go across the sail are, are quite key in um, kind of identifying whether you've got twist or not. Um, and we use those controls to either make the sail twisted or to flatten it out and, and take the twist out of the sail. Yeah, so we're just drawing some lines on there of how deep the sail is. This next picture shows a sail on the left-hand side that's got lots of twist and the top of that sail will be flapping quite a bit. And then we've taken the twist out as we get closer to the right. And that sail on the right, the top of the sail is at the same angle to the wind as the bottom of the sail. Well, that's what we were at least trying to achieve with the, um, with the drawing. So it's another way of controlling how powerful the boat is. And basically we're doing that by how high the boom is. It's kind of an old way of sailing. Most modern boats would sail more like the Elliott 7 that I described earlier, and we want to keep note so, so there's no twist in it at all. And then we use the traveller to spill wind if we need to. But on older boats, this was one of the ways that they used to use to control the um, amount of power that the sail was creating by basically spilling wind off the top of the sail by deliberately putting the top of the sail in the wrong position so it flapped but having the bottom of the sail working quite nicely. Yeah. So yeah, it's definitely not a, um, well, it's a kind of mixture of science and art at the same time. It, it takes a little bit of um, experience to really get the hang of all of the sail controls. Essentially though, they're just pieces of rope that pull on something. And if it's windy, we want to pull on all of them and flatten the sail off as much as we can. And each control does have an effect on a different area of the sail. So the outhaul mainly just flattens the bottom of the sail, the foot. But some of that tension in that fabric will be dispersed in other areas of the sail as well. So if you adjust one, then stand back and look at the sail, you might need to adjust one of the others. But we will go through this on the boats and. I assure you it will be a lot simpler when you actually pull on a rope and see part of the sail move. It will make a lot more sense then. 
Okay. I imagine that a few of you are feeling like that. Let's see if we can rectify that with the model. And I'll just go over some of those sail controls with the model and show you the shapes that we can make um, with just controlling the height of the boom. Okay, so um, yeah, I'm gonna um, Sorry, I'm just gonna try and stop sharing my screen. But okay, I'll switch over to the, the camera and let's go and have a look at the um at the model. Okay, so let's um you can see the model there with the sail flapping around, and we'll come and try and get the camera in a position where we can see the so let's start at the for the head cell for a start. So if I pull the sail down, we can see that we've got quite a big curve in the foot. Um, if I pull with a much flatter angle on the foot of the sail, now that is flat and you can see that we've actually got quite a bit of twist in the sail and the top of the sail is not doing much at all now because it's flapping but if the sail is pulled firmer down so that leech so here we've got a sail where the leech is not really engaged and as I pull the clue down the sail comes in at the top so that's the twist that we're talking about so that's the, um, on my model, my, um, my pulley, if you like, is not a jib car, it's not movable. But if I move this forward, the sail would look more like that. If I moved it back, then it would be flatter and the top of the sail would be flapping around. Okay, so that's the head sail. Let's have a look at the um, main sail. Try and get the camera in the right good angle. All right, so here we've got the boom, we've got the main sheet, which is down the middle of the, the, the sail on this boat, on this model. The, the um, Elliott 7, it's right down here on the end of the boom. So it does the same as the boom vang. So if we've got the boom vang slack and got the, and allow the boom to come up, we can have quite a lot of twist in that sail. If I pull the boom down, we again, same thing with the um, head sail. We just have to forget about that head sail flapping around at the moment. Um, maybe I could stop it from flapping, that would be less distracting. Um, so ease the boom vang, boom goes up, leech gets a big curve in it pull the boom down for those stronger winds to flatten the sail off. And if we're using the traveler to control where the boom is, we can set the shape. Maybe we want a powerful sail, but if I move this pulley over here, then the boom will be at the same height, just a bit further out. And if I move the pulley over to there, then the boom will be the same height, just closer to us. So all of these controls are just about changing the curvature that's in the sail. A flat sail is less powerful. Now, if we look at the luff of the sail, the front edge on this main, you'll see that it's got quite a big curve in it. Now, if I get hold of the front of it, bottom of the sail, like the Cunningham, and pull down, I can make the bit of the fabric above my fingers quite flat. And that's what we'd want to do in uh, windier conditions. Or during the 1950s, I could 
pull on the top of the sail and do the same thing and, and tighten up that leech. So Mr. Cunningham, he wanted his sail to go right to the top of the mast like that. And he decided he was gonna pull the sail down rather than pull it up. Does the same thing, tightens up that front edge of the sail. And you can see now with the boom pulled right down, so if I've got the boom bang on and the Cunningham on, I've got a very flat sail now. I can't show you the um, uh, outhaul on this model because this sail is actually glued onto the, onto the boom. But effectively, if the sail's slack, it's gonna have curve in it. If I pull on the outhaul, it's gonna pull it really tight and it's gonna be flatter. Okay, well, let's go back and um, have a look at the rest of the um, PowerPoint. Does anybody have any questions at that point? Well, I'm gonna turn my fan off as well. Um, let's flip the camera around. Oh, no, I've already flipped the camera around. There we go. Um, and I'll see if I can start sharing my screen again. Awesome, technology is working tonight. Uh, yeah, there we go. So the, the next topic is um, reefing. So if we've, we started out sailing, saying it was a beautiful day, light breeze, and we had our sails quite loose, you know, all of those controls were, the ropes were slack and the sail was nice and fat and full. So we were getting the maximum out of the, the wind that we had. And if the wind picked up a bit, we pulled on those controls and flattened the sail off. And then the wind picked up a bit more and we pulled the, on those outhaul and the Cunningham and the um, boom vang again, we pulled them on really hard. So we pulled them on as hard as we could. If the tiller is still really heavy and we're still overpowered, well, we've got to make the sail smaller. And that's what reefing is. So we don't have to pull it all up. And the picture of the MRX there, you see that there's a bit of sail that's kind of gathered around the boom. And that's because it doesn't go all the way up to the top of the mast. because So we've, we've effectively shortened it. We've made it smaller. And that's how we control the boat in really strong conditions. So all of these controls are about giving the boat the widest possible wind range that we can go sailing in. And the reefing systems are just an extension of that. So we're gonna have a look at the um, reefing on a mainsail. The head sail on um, the MRX, well, the head sail comes in three different sizes. So we've got a small one, a jib, that goes to the mast. And then we've got a genoa, which would go come past the mast and maybe halfway down the window that's in the um, cabin top there. So that's really quite a big, big sail. Um, so a number one is the big sail. A number two is kind of like a medium sized sail. And number three, which is what uh, Learn to Sail has on there. So um, that, that MRX has got the smallest head sail possible and a reef in the um, main sail. So we've gone out. If you look at the sky behind the boat, you can see that it's not a, a really pleasant day, um, but we've gone out sailing anyway. And the way we've managed the power of the boat and we've kept everyone safe on board is to reduce the sail area. So a bit like maybe owning a Ferrari and then you, you don't want the big V12. So you take that out and put a lawnmower engine in because it's, it's a frosty day and you don't want to lose control of the Ferrari. That's basically what we've done here. And it's a lot easier to change the sail size on a boat than it is to do an engine change on a car, I think. Um, okay, let's get back to sailing and we'll have a look at the reefing systems. So the most popular reefing system on, on a lot of boats is a rope that goes through a hole on the back of the sail, then the hole is a bit further up the sail um, than the clue. 
Um, there's another hole, a bit like the boom vang, sorry, not the boom vang, the Cunningham, um, but it's a bit higher than the Cunningham. So you can see that there's a red hole by the mast and there's a corresponding red hole on the leech of the sail, the back edge. And then a bit lower down, we've got a pair of yellow holes. And then lower than that, we've got a pair of green holes. And the reefing line basically pulls the sail down on the back edge. And then there's that hook. And we, we put the corresponding hole on that hook up by the mast. So that's quite a simple reefing system. There are boats that have the, the sail rolled up inside the boom. That's quite a neat system. And basically you just pull as much up the mast as you want. There's other boats that have um, the sail rolled up into the mast. And I don't tend to think that works very well. So if you're gonna roll the sail up into the mast, you have to have a very big mast and that is quite heavy. And you really don't want weight high on a boat. You really want the, all the weight in the keel to keep the stability of the boat. So having weight high on the, on the boat will actually make it rock over quite a bit. Um, so, and the other thing is uh, the expense. So if you're looking at buying a cruising boat and it's got uh, mast furling, they call it, it's a nice, simple, easy system to use. Um, but when it goes wrong, it costs a fortune to fix because it's, you have to take the mast out to service it. And that involves a crane. A much better system if you want to roll the mainsail up would be to have it roll up in the boom. Yes, the boom is bigger and heavier than it would normally be, but it's a lot lower down. So the weight is lower, which means the boat will handle a lot better. And if it goes wrong, two people can take the boom off a boat. You don't need a crane. It's a lot cheaper to service. If you want to keep things really simple, having a rope that pulls the back edge of the sail down, that rope could also pull the front edge of the sail down. But the, the even simpler system is to have a hook to put the front of the sail on and have the rope just pulling the back of the sail down. Um, yeah, so normally cruising boats should have three reefs. On our MRX, we've just got the one reef because you know, we're not going to use the boat in the conditions where you'd need the other reefing points. Um, and let's have a look at what that looks like. So we've got the first reef, the second reef, and the third reef. Um, if you need the second or the third reef, you really should probably study the weather forecasts a bit better um, because that's, you know, that would be extremely windy. Um, if, if you needed those, those those reefing points, but you know if you're sailing around the world, you might not have a, have the option of not sailing. You know if you're two thousand miles off land, well, you've got to deal with the wind that you're you're given. So yeah, probably you would, you would need that third reef. It looks like I need to correct a spelling mistake on that slide as well. Um, okay, so. An older way of doing it would be just to wrap the sail around the boom and use that reefing knot. So you'd have a, a loop of rope with the reef knot in it and multiple holes in the sail that you would just gather the sail up. You don't see that on many boats nowadays. But that's what the sail would look like on the third reef. And you can see that there's a lot of mast sticking out the top, which is not being used. And it's the wind pressure on the top of the mast, which is going to be pushing you around because you know a little bit of pressure on the top of the mast gets magnified by the length of the mast. So the mast becomes quite a big lever to pull the boat over sideways. So if we can get the sail a lot smaller and lower down, then we don't heel over as much. And obviously with a smaller sail, it's going to be a lot less powerful. So that sail is going to be probably less than 50% of the power of the full sail. No reefing systems on the Americans cut boats. They just have different size sails that they put on. So like the MRX, they'll have a number of different head sails that they'll put on, but they'll also have different size main sails that they can put on. 
and um, you can see that that must be quite a windy day. Although the, the sea state is not that bad, but these boats go so fast that even if it's not a windy day, if they're doing 25 knots, well, there's 25 knots on that sail, which is why the sail looks so flat. And if you look at that orange stripe, you'll see that there's not a lot of curvature to that sail at all. And certainly on the end of the boom, which is kind of inside the sail on these boats, you can see that there's, there's quite a lot of tension on it everywhere. So they'd flatten that sail off, not because of the wind strength, but because of the boat speed. And, you know, the air is actually passing over that sail as if it's a 25 knot day. Okay, so we'll have a little interlude here. Let our minds calm down a bit after all of those sail controls and we'll do some knots. And we've got two knots to do. I'm actually gonna do three knots because we'll go over doing the um, bowline again. Um, and we're gonna do a clove hitch and coiling the rope. So let's um, move across to our table where the boat with the rope is. Um, I'm gonna flip the camera around. There we go. All right, so, and I might actually, for this, so you see the rope there is coiled up quite nicely. And it's quite nice to coil the ropes up so that they're not tangled. Um, for us, you know, there's multiple people using the boats and, and it really annoys me when I have to spend 10, 15 minutes untangling ropes. So it's really nice to leave ropes coiled for the other people or even for the next time you go out. So I'm just going to adjust this camera a bit. Um, and stand over here and I'll show you how to coil a rope. So our arms are quite useful in that they're the same length. So if I take one end of the rope and I pull it through my hands to the full extent of my arms, when I put my hands together, that forms a nice coil. When I do that again, that coil is going to be the same length. So you see, I've got a bit of a twist. If I roll it, roll the rope in my fingers, then I can take the twist out. So basically, that's all I'm going to do. I'm going to go to the full extent of my arms, bring my hands together, give it a little roll in my fingers to take the twist out, and that will mean that I've got a rope where all of the coils are a similar length. Now, if I want to take one, um, well, I just can't see what's going out, but yeah, that looks quite good there. Okay, so if I just take one end and wrap it around, that will keep the coils together. And then if I, fold this rope over to make a little loop and poke that through where my hand is. I can then take the tail, pass it through that loop. And then I've got a nice coil of rope and I can tie that up somewhere. It's useful to tie it up because if the ropes are outside, they'll get wet when it gets rained on. But if it's hanging up, the wind will also dry it as well. Another option is to, particularly if I'm out sailing and I just want to tidy the boat up, I might coil up the um, rope like this. But if I'm going to use that rope again, then I might do something different with how I tidy that away. So if I go back to the board, if I just want to hang this rope up, um, if I put it around something and then pull the bottom end of the coils through the top, I can have the rope just hanging like that. And then if I want to use that rope, basically I can just grab it and pull it off and I'm straight into using it. So just wrap it around something basically. So I've already done the coils and I've got the two, um, all right, I've got the two 
like the top of the coil and the bottom of the coil. I'm just going to pass the bottom of the coil through and pull that. And then that will sit there. And it will stay there all day while I'm sailing. And maybe it's a dock line. And when I come into the dock and I'm a bit worried about hitting the dock, you know, just pull on the rope and then I can use that for whatever I need to do to um, avoid hitting the boat or avoid you know, tying the boat up, whatever I need. Okay, so the next knot we've got to do is a clove hitch. And I'm just going to use the wallpaper to figure out where I need to tie this. Yeah, so that looks like a good position for the camera. So if I wrap the rope around something, when I come back up, if I go across the first wrap around, when I come under, I just need to poke the tail under the bit that crosses. And when I pull that tight, we get a clove hitch. And that's what the clove hitch looks like on the top. So I'll just loosen that off a bit. So I've gone across, I've gone round, and I'm just gonna poke the tail underneath the one that crosses over. And when I pull that tight, we've got two ropes that are going opposite ways and the one on the top applying some pressure. So that will actually stay done up quite readily um, for a long time. Sometimes I, I use that to tow other boats with. It's actually quite easy to undo, um, but it's, it's quite a secure knot when there's tension on the rope. Okay. So I did promise to have another look at the bowline. So let's have another look, go at that. Well, maybe I'll just show you the clove hitch again. So I'm gonna go round, the rope comes up, it's gonna go across, and then I'm just gonna poke the tail under, and I'm gonna pull it tight. So pull towards the wall in my case with the tail, and the longer bit, I'm gonna pull the opposite way just to pull this bit that crosses over down hard on top of the rope. Okay, so the bowline. So we're gonna go around something. This is gonna form the loop that we can throw to someone that's in the water. I've got the short end here and my hand that holds the short end, I'm just gonna poke my finger out and uh, wrap the rope around. That's going to form the loop that crosses underneath. And then I can take my tail and I'll call it a rabbit from now on. So rabbit lives underground, he comes up out of his hole. He's going to run behind the tree. And he's going to get scared and he's going to go back down in his burrow to safety. And we're going to get that nice life jacket shape. So Go that, do that again. So finger out on the short one, wrap the rope around. That creates a loop that crosses underneath. This is part of the knot. Rabbit comes out the hole, goes around the back of the tree, back down the hole and pull it tight. Okay, um, with all of these knots during our practical session, there will be opportunity to um, have another go at those. And um, yeah, this is actually one of our training rooms. Um, we've got a view of the marina out this, this window and tea and coffee machine. I tend to think that's essential for going through this um, theory stuff. And then a nice view of the harbor. And quite often use this window during my teaching you know, point out the flags at the top of the Harbour Bridge. There's some other flags that are in the car park that you can just see by the roof there. Um, they're, they're small flags, so they quite often fly in lighter wind where the flags on the top of the bridge don't. But it's quite useful to stand here and talk about the clouds and what we can see on the water. And from this elevated position, that we get quite a good view. Um, and in a little while, they'll turn the lights on the bridge and it will look quite pretty. Okay, let's um, go back to the um, PowerPoint. We're nearly there. We've just got man overboard to cover. And I will start sharing my screen again. There we go. 
Share that. Great. Um, right, so there we go. That's what a coil of rope looks like. Um, and yeah, there's probably a better view of the top of the clove hitch with that rope going across, holding the other two loops together. It's a simple knot, um, but it's quite um, effective. Um, YouTube note down the bottom of the page there. So there are some, I think, much better videos on our YouTube channel about tying knots if you want to do a bit more practice. And yeah, American Magic, Man Overboard. Now, quite important to be able to go and pick up our crew if someone falls off the boat. You know, it's um, pretty bad form to carry on sailing. And there's a couple of techniques, which I'm going to show go through now, which will lead to a successful recovery of, of someone that's fallen over the side. Um, you see that that guy's wearing a life jacket and um, it's a lot easier to do a recovery if the person's wearing a life jacket because, well, basically it takes the pressure off. You know they're on the surface of the water. You know, you, there's no, yes, there's some urgency getting back to them, but if they've got a life jacket on, they're going to be floating you know, for, I don't know, several days. So rather than getting back to them within two minutes or else they're going to drown, you know, you've just bought yourself a lot more time and that in itself takes a lot of pressure off and you'll probably find because the pressure's off, you do actually pick them up in a couple of minutes. Um, yeah, and it's better to be prepared because, you know, by the very nature of accidents, you know, we don't we don't put them in our diary to have an accident at two o'clock on Monday. You know, they happen randomly when we're not expecting it. And, you know, by that, you know, it's, there's no time to go and grab a life jacket at that point. OK, so there's an amusing video of um, someone getting wet, which um, I hope is going to play. Here we go. And boof. There we go. So that was a crash jibe. And if we, um, well, let's go back and have a little look at that again. I do find that quite amusing. Um, there we go. So that person's just holding the boom over. It's light wind and they do a crash jibe. So they obviously weren't um, really taking account of what direction they were sailing in relative to the wind. And suddenly the wind was behind that sail and blew it across. If they were sailing with a bit more of an angle to the wind, it wouldn't have happened. But if you look at them now, all three people that are left on that boat are looking at the person that's in the water. And if you look slightly further forward, you'll see that the head sail is full and on the other side of the boat. So in about two seconds if that video had run a little bit longer we would have seen them doing a crash jibe the other way and I would be surprised if at least one of them didn't have a head injury um, yes someone's in the water but you've still got to sail the boat and it really is worth avoiding the, the crash jibe the person that's in the water is probably going to be fine because they got pushed off the boat rather than hitting the head but um, yeah Crash jibe is quite a difficult um, situation. Quite often, someone will get in the water because of a crash jibe. That mo the most likely reason why someone's in the water is because there's been a crash jibe. Um, much better to avoid that by sailing with a bit of an angle, as we discussed in, the, in lesson two, I think it was, where the wind is coming over the corner of the boat, the back corner because that boom is likely to stay there. You know, we've got to wander off course a lot to get the wind to blow the sail across the boat. Anyway, let's go and get into um, man overboard recovery. So this is a photograph of uh, Don Fong, one of the Volvo Ocean Racing boats. And this is actually in Auckland. That's um, uh, Glenn Dowie in the background, I think. Um, and 
for the import race, they, you know, raced up and down the harbour. The harbour was closed on that day and they raced up and down and they had a celebrity on board. And after the, basically the finish of the, the harbour race was the start of the next leg. So the, because the celebrities um, didn't want to go to Brazil, they had to jump off. So he's actually planning to jump off. Uh, I think some of them uh, quite enjoy it. But they've got ribs out there ready to pick them up. Um, number one rule, stay calm. And it's exceptionally difficult to stay calm if someone's in the water, you know. If you're sailing with a group of people, um, they're either friends that you quite like sailing with or they're members of your family, which you, you know, care a lot more for. Either way, someone you like or love is in the water and they may well die if you don't go and pick them up. So that reality puts a lot of pressure on people. It's really hard to stay calm. Having a life jacket on takes a little bit of the pressure off, um, but, Man overboard recovery is something to be very professional about. Um, and you need to be very calm when you're doing it. Um, so the person who sees the other person fall off the boat, they immediately become the um, uh, watcher, basically, and they're going to just point at the person in the water. Wherever the boat turns, they're just going to keep pointing because if you take your eyes off them, then with the waves and turning the boat around, you know, you might be looking at a completely different piece of water than where they are. Um, and we don't want to keep it a secret, you know, even if you push them over the side, you know, we don't want to keep it a secret. We need to go and pick them up. Um, throw markers in the water. So yeah, if it's going to take a little while to get back, it's a really good idea to throw anything that floats off the back of the boat. So chili bins, um, extra cans of diesel. Diesel's lighter than water and it floats. So a full can of diesel will float. Um, seat cushions, rubbish, you know, plastic bottles, um, whatever there is to hand, if it floats, if you throw it out the back of the boat, then there's kind of a debris field, which is a much bigger area for you to be able to spot and return to. So it's a good idea to suddenly turn into a little bag and start throwing trash out the back of the boat. Yeah, we're not going to do that in our training exercise, but if it's about saving someone's life, I think it's okay. Um, yeah, so we want to point at the person in the water. We want to shout, make sure everybody knows that someone's fallen off. And then we want to start throwing stuff out the back of the boat to kind of mark the position. Also, you know, if someone's not wearing a life jacket, throwing the chili bin out the back might give them something to grab onto. You certainly hear stories of people that have been floating around in the sea for days clinging to a chili bin. So, you know, stuff that floats is, is pretty handy to have out in the water. Um, this next slide is pretty grim reading. Um, in Auckland, the water is warm all year round and we don't really need to worry about survival times. If you're sailing on the South Island, or you know, in, in colder waters, then this um, definitely comes into play. Probably though, if you're sailing in those conditions, um, you're gonna be wearing you know, better clothing. So you're gonna be you know, prepared for that. Um, but there's uh, the sort of times of survival times that people might have. So it's pretty important to get back to people fairly quick. If the Coast Guard is an hour and a half away from giving you assistance, well, surely it'd be better to pick them up from the boat that they fell off. You know, you're already in the vicinity. The Coast Guard hasn't got to launch a boat and then spend time getting up to you and then spend time trying to locate the person. So we're going to go over two um, methods of picking someone up, but it's really good idea to do everything possible not to have someone in the water and you know um, I, I like safety equipment you know I, I talk a lot about 
uh, life jackets. Um, very few people around the club wear life jackets regularly. They might do if it was particularly rough weather um, or if they were sailing on a big trip that was, uh, you know, 100 miles offshore. Well, yeah, sure, maybe they'll put a life jacket on then, but quite often they won't um, because it's not cool. And I think that's ridiculous. Safety equipment is cool. It means that you can take risks and live to tell the tale. Um, and I'd much rather do that. So, um, yeah. So we're gonna go over two of the main maneuvers that we can do to pick someone up. And we're gonna look at, yeah, the logic of, of, of what we're doing there. And when we actually do the practical session, we'll do the, both of these maneuvers for, for real. We're not going to ask anyone to jump in the water. We're just going to use a life jacket and go and pick that up um, and then come back in. Um, and everybody will get a, a go to practice this maneuver. Um, at level one, having an understanding of the concept is, is fine. Um, with our level two course that goes out to Cow Hour, um, we'll, we'll spend most of Saturday on that trip doing man overboard drills. And at the end of that day, everyone's pretty good at it. And we kind of really need everyone to be really good at it because that level two cruising course is basically, you know, everybody doing that to get out cruising and being in remote places. And if you're in a remote place, you need to be self-sufficient and be able to deal with emergencies like this. So we kind of need everyone to be really good at it at the level two cruising course, but at level one, if we can kind of get round and we've got pretty much a good understanding of what the process is, then that, that's good enough for level one. Um, but you will have a bit of an idea of, of, of how to do it. But, well, and, you know, there's an opportunity to get quite good at it, actually. We'll spend a bit of time doing it. So if we have a look at these boats, um, we'll see that um, we've got some person in the water and then someone very generously holding their hand out. If we look at the sails, all of the sails are eased quite a long way. One of the boats has got a Jenica up. And I would suggest that those boats are heading downwind. And they're probably doing six or seven knots at least. And that person in the water can't swim very fast. You know, if they could swim at two knots, they would be doing well. Um, so I don't know why that guy's holding his hand out. He's got no chance of helping that guy back on board. We're not going to be able to rescue anybody if we're going downwind because the boat won't stop. We need to turn the boat around and be head to wind, have our sails flapping. That's the only way we can stop the boat. So if you think back to lesson one, when we went through points of sail, one of the first things we told you was how to stop the boat. So that's going to be our kind of final position with the bow of the boat pointing into the waves, pointing towards where the wind is coming from and the sails flapping, not developing any power and stationary. And then we can extend a hand to the person in the water and pull them back on board or throw them a rope with a bowline tied in the end. So this is the position that we're talking about. So we've got the wind coming from the top of the board, top of the top of the screen. And we want to have our sails flapping and not developing any power at all. Now, if we look at those two boats, the one that's windward, the one that's closest to that wind arrow, to the person that's in the life ring, that boat will move downwind onto the person that's in the life ring. And that's quite a good um, position to be in. So, we could turn the boat up into wind, stop, and then allow the wind to blow us closer to them. The boat that's nearer the bottom of the page, they're going to have to get really close to the person in the water and stop, get a rope to them before the wind blows them away from them. Because the windage on the boat is going to mean that the boat's going to move faster than the person that's in the water. Uh, when we uh, do this in our practical sessions. Sometimes we use uh, a buoy that's out in the in the harbour. Um, there's lots of buoys, and some of them are quite conveniently co located to 
to use as a person over board. So they'll sail past it, turn around and come back and pretend we're gonna pick up the buoy. If we're gonna do that, then we're always the lured boat. So the one that's furthest away from the wind. The reason we do that is because I don't wanna get blown onto a buoy that's attached to the seabed and get tangled up with it. Um, if we're using a life jacket, we'll do it on the windward side probably. Um, and as it's shown there. So there's a, both ways will work, um, but the boat at the bottom, you don't have so much time to get the person that's in the water. Um, yeah, so we wanna be next to them and we wanna be stationary. Um, there's not a lot of chance of picking someone up as you sail past. But uh, yeah, good question. How do we get to that position? Well, the next couple of slides will show us how to do that. So um, we don't want to jibe. The reason I would rather not jibe is because jibing is a more difficult maneuver to pull off. And as we saw in that video, you know, doing a jibe incorrectly is quite dangerous. And if you think to that situation with someone we care about is in the water, there's a lot of pressure on us to sail that boat back to them and pick them up and save their life. So, and we've also got one person pointing. So they're not paying any attention to the sailing. They're just concentrating on the person that's in the water. So if I'm on the helm and I say, right, let's jibe, and I throw the boat into a jibe straight away, in particular, that person that's pointing may well have a head injury moments later. So let's just take jibing off the table. We're not going to jibe. We're going to tack. We're going to tack because it's an easy maneuver. If the person pointing, you know, standing up and the boom comes towards them quite slowly, they've got time to duck. If it hits them, it's not going to really do any damage. They're not going to enjoy it, but they're not going to be severely hurt. So attack in a situation where there's a lot of pressure to get things right is a much better choice of manoeuvre to do rather than a jibe, which we need all the crew on board to make the boat work, to be able to pull all the sails in to get that round and then ease the sails to make it safe. And we've got one crew member in the water, so we might not have enough crew to actually make the jibe safe. We've also got one crew member standing up pointing. So in effect, we've lost two crew members. So I imagine to do a jibe safely is actually gonna be quite difficult in that situation because we haven't got the people we need to control the boat through the jibe. But tacking is easy. We push the tiller and turn into wind and the sail comes across nice and slowly. It's a much safer, simpler maneuver to do with less crew. So we're not gonna jibe. Um, we don't wanna drop the sails. So quite often people will say, well, let's just take the sails down, turn the motor on. And if at the end of the day, when we're packing the boat up, that might take 10, 15 minutes to take the sails down and pack them all up nicely. So we're sure as hell not gonna do that. We've got somebody in the water, we're in a rush. So we're just gonna open the jammers, dump the sails on the deck, and press the start button. So the boat's gonna be untidy. There's gonna be lots of trip hazards and there might be some ropes in the water. Quite common for ropes to be in the water. So there'd be a little bit go over the side, water splash on that will pull a bit more out. And suddenly we've got a long length of water in a long, long length of rope in the water. And as soon as we hit that start button, that rope will go through the propeller and stop the motor. And we've then disabled our boat. So we can't pull the sails up because they're now tied to the propeller and the engine won't run because that rope has um, jammed up the prop shaft. You'd think the propeller spinning around would just chop the rope up, but it, it doesn't. The rope wraps around and when it gets tight, it stalls the motor out and stops it. So that boat's disabled until somebody else can get off the boat, swim underneath it, and cut the rope off the propeller and then get back on board. 
and you know you, you you've doomed everybody if that happens so it's much better to leave the sails up if you you know if you've got a, a roller furling system where the sails roll up into the boom or roll up around the forestay then yeah sure rolling the sails up would be a good idea um, but if you've got to drop the sails off on the deck and fold them up and make them nice and neat and tidy um, to keep everything on board and not have a sail or a rope over the side, then this is going to take too long. Um, yeah, we don't want to panic. We can, we can do this manoeuvre in a couple of minutes. It's really quite easy once you've practised a bit, and I would recommend everyone practise. When your hat blows off, that's a good idea to practise a man overboard drill. You know, hat blows off, shout man overboard, go and pick your hat up. There's a little bit less pollution in the sea. You get to practice the man overboard drill. It happens at random times when people are not expecting it and you spend less money on hats. So that's, that's a good thing. Um, yeah. So we're gonna, oh, it's even on the slide. Must be good advice. All right, so here we are. This is the, the first method of picking someone up that's gone over the side of the boat. So we've got, Someone in the water, they're not very happy. We're sailing upwind. We don't want to sail upwind any further because that just means we've got to sail downwind further to pick them up. And sailing downwind is quite slow. So let's not sail upwind anymore. We're going to bear away onto a reach and we're going to sail away from them. And we, that seems a bit crazy. Why would we want to sail away from them? Well, we need to create a bit of space for us to do a tack and then kind of half attack, which you'll see in a moment. So we're going to sail away. In the Yachting New Zealand Level 1 book, which I'll give the, to the people that come on the practical course, it says five boat lengths, I think. I think that's too much. Um, three boat lengths should be enough for you to do a tack. I've done this manoeuvre on small boats and big boats. You know, the biggest boat I've sailed is 67 feet long, an old classic boat called Innesmara. Really cool boat. And I was amazed that, yeah, two boat length, two of her boat lengths, I could get her back round to pick, pick up a life jacket. Never had a man overboard um, on a course, or not the level two course anyway. Um, right, so we're going to be reaching. And when we think we've got far enough away, we're going to do a tack. And then, so no jibe involved, nice and safe. The sail comes around quite easily. It's kind of like a granny tack that I showed you in the lesson two. We're going to ease our sails out and we're going to sail downwind. We've got a bit of an angle to the wind, so we're going to be sailing quite fast. It's more of a broad reach rather than actually running. And then as we get a bit further down, if we can roll the head sail up or get rid of that, that's a good idea because we don't want to go be going fast. We want to be slowing the boat down because we're going to have to stop shortly. Roller furling where the sail um, wraps around the forestay is quite common on, 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 on a lot of uh, cruising boats. Um, yeah, so we're sailing downwind. It's quite quiet. As we said before, with the like one of the first slides of this um, PowerPoint, with the sensations of sailing, sailing downwind feels quite calm. So if we're reaching away from the person and doing the tack, that might be quite frantic, fast, powerful, waves hitting the side of the boat. But after the tack, everything will be calm on the boat. The boat will be going quite fast. Yes, but it will feel slow because we're going in the same direction as the wind and the waves. So that's a really good time to start preparing the boat. There's nothing for us to do apart from sail downwind and get the boat lured downwind of the person that's in the water because we need to be going upwind to stop the boat. So we've got time to start the motor or roll the head sail up. Now I know I said a moment ago not to start the motor but what I actually said was don't drop the sails and then start the motor. If the sails are up and we start the motor there's not much chance of getting a rope wrapped around the prop and if we've got the motor on we might be able to use it to help us. So it would be a good time now to start the motor, 
roll the head sail up if that's easy to do. If not, just let it flap around. Um, and then when we get to point five, we're lower than the person in the water. And now we can start sailing upwind. And this is where the motor would come in to, to help us possibly. Um, and we're gonna get, so we're in a position like that. We're gonna ease the sail out, we're gonna stop. We're gonna throw the person a rope and we're gonna get them back on board. Now, I'm 110 kilos. If you imagine I'm in the water and I'm wearing a lot of clothing and I'm heavy, yeah. How would you get me in the boat? It'd be tough. Um, the bow of the boat is quite high because it has to deal with the waves hitting it. The back of the boat is lower. Quite often there's boarding ladders on the, on the back of the boat. Um, so if I'm conscious, then throwing a rope to me, guiding me to the back of the boat and letting me climb up the boarding ladder would be a good way of doing it. But there's also a lot of lifting equipment. You know, there's winches and ropes and things. So getting a bowl and a big loop, getting that over my shoulders and putting me on a, on a halyard and kind of winching me up the mast, that would get me back on board as well. So you don't need to physically grab me and pull me on board because that's going to take two or three people probably. Um, using the, the um, winches and the ropes that are on board, that, that's the way to do it. You know, if, if the person can't use the boarding ladder. Um, this is a slide I borrowed from our American coach, Rick, and I, I really quite like it because it, it is quite thought provoking in terms of how we approach. So on this slide, the person in the water is that black dot and we've got a number of boats there. And let's go through and examine each boat's approach and see whether it would work or not. So at the moment, the boat that's at got the sails on that's sailing downwind and that can get to the person but it can't stop because the wind is going to keep pushing on those sails and it, they're just going to run them down um, so if we try and sail to the person from upwind of them then we're going to find that we can't stop if we try and sail straight into the wind then we are stopped and we're not going to get there. If we've got the engine running, we might be able to drive up to them, but we're not going to sail up to them with our sails flapping like that boat in the middle. So we've got this area that we can't get to them in. And if we're on a reach, well, we can definitely get there. That's the fastest point of sail. We'll get there quite quickly we're probably not gonna be able to get rid of the speed and we may not be able to ease the sails enough to stop. They might still be pushing us forwards, even though we've eased them, we might not be able to get them out enough. So we can't reach into them. Um, sailing upwind is the only way we can do it. So there's a kind of Goldilocks zone there where we're either on a close reach or close hauled and we're sailing upwind to the person that's in the water. That's the only direction that we can go in where we can get to the person that's in the water and stop when we get there. This other boat um, that's approaching from the left-hand side of the page on a, a reach. So if you find yourself in that position, what should you do? Well, if you realize you're reaching and you're not gonna be able to stop, if you bear away, and get into that green zone, then you can start sailing upwind and you'll be able to stop. If you're the other boat at the bottom of the screen with sails that are just starting to flap and you're desperately wanting to keep going upwind, but you're just in the no-go zone and you're losing power and the boat's slowing down. So you're getting the idea that you're not gonna get there. Um, the thing to do there is to bear away get into that Goldilocks zone, I often call it, and then tack and approach 
prompt as that boat on the right hand side in that green area. So once we've done that figure of eight and we've sailed downwind, we want to be having a look at the person that's in the water, trying to figure out whether we're downwind of them. And I often like using the waves. So the waves will be a nice straight lines. And if the wave hits them before it hits us, then we're lower on that wave pattern, lower downwind of them. And then we can start turning up. Um, yeah, okay. So there is another maneuver. Now, this is not part of uh, the Yachting New Zealand course uh, at level one, it is part of level two. Um, but I've uh, started to teach it in level one because it's actually a simpler maneuver to do. Um, and we actually get quite a lot of couples that are wanting to go sailing as a couple. So if you're sailing and there's you and your partner and one of you fall in the water, you don't really want to sail away from them. Um, you just want to stop the boat. And, you know, because there's not, you know, you're down to sailing the boat single-handed. And that's going to be quite difficult to do that figure of eight when you're on your own. So this heave two method would be the way I would suggest that we do a man overboard um, recovery if you were sailing short-handed. Um, yeah, well, let's go through it. So basically, we've got the person in the water at the bottom of the screen and their boat sailing upwind. And if the boat tacks and leaves the head sail on the wrong side of the boat, we can maybe take a show, the, show you on the model shortly. Um, so normally that head sail would be on the right hand side of the boat. Um, mm. So the boat two I'm talking about. So the boat's tacked, the main sail has switched sides, but the head sail is on the left hand side of the boat. It's inverted because the wind is on the wrong side of it, um, but we haven't released it. And this is the heave to position. So basically that head sail is going to want to force the boat backwards, but the main sail is pushing the boat forwards. And we kind of get a stalemate where the boat stops dead. A bit like jamming the handbrake on on the car. So if you're sailing along and your partner falls off the boat, if you just tack, and that's all the sailing you have to do, you just move the tiller. There's no adjusting of the sails or anything. And hold the boat so it's pointing up into wind. The boat will stop dead very quickly. And that means you're quite close to them. If they're conscious, you'd probably be even close enough for them to swim and catch up with you. But we can use that wind to push us down onto the person that's in the water. So with the sails up, the sail cloth is tight. It's, it's not flapping, so the boat's really quiet. It's a really nice, calm way of doing the, the man overboard recovery as well. So if you hit the start button on your motor. And what we're gonna do is use the wind to allow that boat to blow downwind, but we might get off course a little bit. So we're just gonna use the motor. If we get behind, we're gonna drive forward. If we get too far forward, we're gonna drive back. And we'll end up right next to the person, just like that. And I, I really like that on our level three course that goes out to Great Barrier we do a man overboard drill at night and this is the method I use to do that recovery um, of the life jacket definitely nobody gets off the boat at night um, no one authorized swimming at night on my boat um, anyway so we throw a life jacket in the water and then we'll do this man overboard drill and it's yeah it's so it steps up, you know, and at level one, try and keep it simple. We'll go through the maneuver, but don't stress. You don't necessarily have to be really good at it. I suggest you want to practice it and get good at it. The level two course to pass that course, you need to be 
quite good at doing the man overboard drill. You know, we really, you know, if you're going to go out cruising with your friends and family, you need to be able to pick them up if one someone falls off. And on the level three cruising course, well, we're just going to notch that standard up a bit more and we're going to do it at night and make it really hard to find the person. And that's one of the reasons why I like this heave to method, because as soon as the person falls over the side, you're immediately tacking into that hove to position, and stopping the boat, and you're not sailing too far away from them. And there's very little sailing to do. Literally, all you've got to do is turn the wheel or move the tiller so you tack and then straighten up, and that's it. That's sailing done. Then we're just going to sit and wait for the wind to blow the boat down to the person. It's quite an easy manoeuvre to do. Some race boats, it's a bit difficult because the, the way the race boats are quite often set up to be very manoeuvrable and unstable, if you like, which is great if you're in control. Um, cruising boats, though, they're dead easy to do this heave to. Um, they're very even on the power, so the head sail will generate approximately the same amount of power as the main sail, so they cancel each other out nicely. The boat's really nicely balanced and it will heave to really well. Certainly that's my experience. Um, and this is really pretty straightforward. Um, starting the motor up, you know, if this is the person and you've got a bit too, you're going to miss them, well, you just drive forward. So we're not trying to reverse to the person. We're just trying to keep between the wind and the person in the water, sort of maintain our position and just allow the wind to do its thing and blow us down onto the person that's in the water. And I think there's one more slide. Yeah, how would you get the person back on board? Well, we've already talked about that a little bit. So swim platform, boarding ladder, rope, halyard winch. Um, yeah, and if you need to get somebody else in the water, a, a swimmer to go and take a rope to them, you really need a rope on that person that's getting in the water. Otherwise, you've got two men overboards. So, you know, if, if someone goes to swim and the, the thing that I think people get caught out with is that they think the boat's stationary and it's not. The boat is going downwind. And while you're sitting on the boat, it doesn't really feel like it's doing anything. It's just sitting there. Um, but as soon as you get off the boat, then you realize how fast the boat's moving. And it can be a problem to swim and get back on board. So that's why I say if you're getting off, if you're at an anchorage and you're anchored, then yeah, sure, go for a swim. But if the boat is underway, not anchored, it's free to move with, with the tide, with the wind, with the waves then you might find you can't swim fast enough to keep up with how fast the boat's moving. Even though while you're sitting on the boat, drinking your beer, thinking it'd be nice to go for a swim, it would be feel like the boat's not moving. But reality is it is, and you don't realize that until you've dived in and the boat's getting smaller. Um, yes, I really hope I haven't put anyone off with all these scare stories. Um, there's lots of equipment to make things safe. You know, there's life jackets. There's things you can have in your life jackets that are um, locator beacons. They're quite expensive, like $700 or something. But they use a satellite and uh, GPS to locate the person that's in the water. Um, it, and so if you're sailing offshore, then I would think those things are essential. Um, yeah. So there's, there's lots of technology, there's lots of sailing skills that we can teach you. It will teach you some in the level one course. We'll step that up in the level two. We'll step it up again in the level three. Certainly after the level three course, you should be quite confident that you can handle most situations on a boat without needing the Coast Guard. But, you know, the Coast Guard are there to call. Um, there's a really good organisation, um, all volunteers. It's $115 to join. That's a real no-brainer. They'll bring you diesel. They'll tow you back. 
they'll pull you off the rocks, they'll come and rescue you if you're man overboard and you can't pick them up. Um, you know, you can call them as much as you like for $115 a year. It's, it's crazy good value. Um, so there's lots of things that you can put in place before you go sailing to make this all safe. Um, but really, the people that aren't safety conscious, that aren't, have, don't have any thought for this, they're unfortunately the ones that are going to have a problem at some point. Um, so being safety conscious, it's like our sailing school, we, we haven't really needed a first aid kit in the last four years. It's not because we haven't done stuff that's considered not dangerous. We certainly have been sailing in a range of conditions, but we use best practice, we teach best practice, and we find that we don't have the accidents, but we're definitely prepared should they come up. Um, I think that is the last slide. Yeah, we're back to the beginning. Let's go to the um, uh, model just quickly for two minutes and I'll show you the Hove 2 method and um, we'll, 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 we'll go through that and how we don't move the, um, the sail over. Okay, let's just flip the camera over. All right, flick the model on. Right, so if I pull the head sail on and the main sail as well. So there we are sailing in our upwind position. Main sail in, head sail in. And to hove to, so someone falls in the water here, all I'm going to say is let's tack. Um, I'm probably going to give the order not to release this rope. So the head sail stays on this side of the boat. So normally in a tack, the head sail would swap sides. But in the hove too, we're going to leave it on the wrong side of the boat. And the, the main sail is there as well. So this sail wants the boat to come backwards. The main sail is still pushing it forwards. And we end up in a kind of stalemate type position and the boat stops dead. So let's just go through that again. Oh, um, I will just go over how you get out of this as well. So um, basically to get the boat going again, all we need to do is take the handbrake off. If we let go of the sail, put it through on the other side, suddenly we're sailing. So we're sailing along, someone falls off. Right, we're going to hove to the tech, our head sail inverts, starts pushing us backwards. Our main sail continues to push us forward as that's swap sides and the boat stops. The boat, because our fan's not powerful enough, but the boat will be going downwind as the wind blows on the boat. And that's going to take us to the person that's in the water. Once we've done the recovery, nice and calm, Sails aren't flapping around, it's nice and quiet on the boat. We've got time to think. All we need to do after we've done the recovery, when we've, everyone's happy and we're all okay, just swap the sail over and we're sailing again. Pretty easy maneuver. All right. Um, flip the camera back round. Okay. So um, that completes lesson three. Uh, well done for making the end of that lesson. I know some of the topics are quite meaty and a bit of a job to get your head around. It will start coming together when we actually start doing some practical stuff. And the really good news is there that from the 3rd of December, lockdown's over for most people anyway, and we can get out sailing again. So I'll get that schedule up early next week and I'll flick everyone an email and let you know when the sailing days will be to complete this course. If you feel that some of this theory stuff has been a little bit of a job to understand, maybe consider doing one of our regular courses because I think that's probably a better way of learning. You know, if we do lesson one and then we do the practical part of lesson one, then that bit of knowledge is done. 
you know, you've seen it on the whiteboard, you've seen the PowerPoint presentation, you've done it out on the water, and you've locked in that knowledge. And then you come back the next week, we do lesson two, we do that bit of practical stuff out on the water, and that bit of knowledge is done, and it all builds. So without being able to go out on the water and do the practical part following the theory lesson, we've not really prepared you very well for the second lesson. Um, so I've done the best I can to get through this theory and I've used the model to try and illustrate some of the stuff that happens out on the water. Um, sailing is not difficult. There's a lot of very simple things that happen simultaneously. So there's a lot to think about, but each thing is actually quite simple. Um, there's a lot of funny words that we use, you know, 400 year old English words, which we don't use in everyday life. There's another layer of complication. So if you need a little bit more time on the theory, don't stress about that. Just sign up for one of our regular courses. And I'm sure you'll find that actually doing the, the theory, then doing the practical that covers that theory will be a much better learning experience for you. If you feel ready to go out on the water and do all of these practical stuff in one go. So it will be a quite a big day. We're going to do lesson one in the morning, come in, have lunch, and we'll do lesson two and three in the afternoon. So we'll probably start at nine and finish at six, but with a nice break in the middle. Um, I'm interested to see with this concept about the learning experiences and, and outcomes. If so people need more time, then I'll just find another course that you can just come into and, and there won't be any charge for that. You can just squeeze into another course that's already running and just pick up the extra time that you need to get that topic um, you know, done. Um, yeah, so I'll work on the schedule. I get it all out early next week and then I'll email everyone, tell you what the um, schedule is, and then you can just pick your days that you want to come in. Um, so like I say, my plan at the moment is for Saturday and Sunday courses, also some evening courses. So they won't be um, a big long session. So we're only going to have two or three hours in the evening to sail, but we won't do any theory. We'll just go straight out on the water. So at five o'clock, come back in when it gets dark at say half eight. Um, and so, so three evening sessions or one Saturday or one Sunday. Um, I might throw in a midweek one as well. So I'm not quite sure what day yet, but say a Wednesday rather than a Saturday or Sunday for those of you that are still not able to get into the office. So I try and make lots of different options and hopefully there'll be something there for everybody to do the practical stuff. Um, if you haven't signed up for the practical session that goes along with this free theory course, the practical side of things, we we do actually need to charge some money for that because it costs us money to take a boat out the marina. So it's $250 and you can book that now on the website. So you'll see there's one that doesn't have a date. Um, it's just says to be confirmed. And that's because it's been there you know, during lockdown and I wasn't sure when lockdown would end and we'd be able to do that practical stuff. Um, but yeah, you can sign up for that there and the, the actual dates for when we're sailing should be available Monday or Tuesday. Um, yeah, so does anybody have any questions? I, I think um, there was one come through. Uh, one. Okay, so thanks Maureen. Um, I'm looking forward to seeing you on that practical one as well. Um, does anybody else have any questions at all? I'm very happy to go over anything from lesson one right through to lesson three. If you want to stick your microphone on or um, just ask away in that chat box. No, doesn't look like it. All right. Well, thanks very much for attending this evening. Um, I will hopefully look forward to seeing you out in the water at some point. Uh, it would be like one of my greatest pleasures is meeting ex students in bays on cool islands somewhere. So I look forward to sharing a beer with you on a bay, in a bay somewhere. 
Um, lots of cool stuff happening here at the Yacht Squadron once we get sailing again. And um, oh, the other thing to mention is that you do get a membership with the course. So you get a month membership of the Yacht Squadron and you can kind of come and try the club out for free if you like. All right. Thanks very much for tonight. Really appreciate you attending and get, see you another day out in the water, I hope. All right. Thanks. Awesome. Thank you. Cheers. Perfect. Cheers. Cool. Thanks, everyone.